I'm telling you, if you have the choice between having a film coming out no commercials and with a lot of commercials, <laughs> you want to have commercials. <laughs> Miracle at St. Anna addresses, does a lot of stuff. It's deep, it's complicated, and it's not, it's not a movie that, it's a movie about friendship, really. It's not even about black soldiers. It's about the friendship of a little Italian boy. It's, a, it's about what black Americans feel every day, that we are truly inside human. Now, what our face makes us a political statement, but inside, we are the same, and that's why this soldier and this boy are the same. And that's what the movie is really about. Film, 50% of the film is, is in Italian, is, is, it takes place in Italy and it's with subtitles. Why was it so. important to keep the language? Make it authentic. You know, I'm tired of seeing war films where uh, everybody's speaking English, <laughs> especially Nazis. <laughs> <laughs> and I think this kind of history really, com really contributes to reason and discourse. That's what we've been missing in this country for the last eight years is reason and discourse. If you have reason and discourse, everything else will follow. I mean, I mean. America, was, especially in the South, I don't, I don't even like to call it Jim Crow anymore. It was apartheid. It was apartheid. And as James had uh, wrote the line for <laughs> this Dems character, so it's a shame I feel more at home in a foreign country than I do my own. I know about that. You know. The, Nisi, the, the Japanese Americans who fought for the uh, United States in World War II actually fought as part of the 92nd Division toward the end of the war. Um, the 92nd Division suffered so many casualties that at a certain point they had to integrate the division. And they integrated the division with three different regiments. The black regiment, a white regiment, and the Nisi uh, Regiment. And the Nisi Regiment, including Daniel in Inuawe, what's that, the Hawaiian senator? Uh, they, were, they were excellent soldiers. The only thing was when I interviewed one of the commanders in the 92nd, he said they had a hard time getting shoes from their feet were so small and they liked rice. They had to get rice for these cats and they didn't get rice, they were pissed <laughs> off. But they were great, they were, they were, there's a statue in La Spezia of a Nisi American soldier. But here's the irony. Because the same time you had these Japanese Americans, they didn't, they, didn't, they didn't send them to the Pacific to fight against Japanese. Uh-uh, they sent them to Europe. That's right. Also, at the same time you had Japanese Americans fighting for America, thousands of Japanese Americans were imprisoned. Right. Because right after Pearl Harbor, they locked them, took their homes, businesses, locked, them, locked their asses up. So. Again, you have these ironies, the same thing with the, with the German POWs. Like, we have a scene in the, in the film that's, that's not, in the, I'm not, some people might not have seen it, but it's not a big giveaway. We have a scene that's not in the novel, where it's a flashback to the, 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 four, the five main characters when they're basic training. It is a little known fact, but true, that thousands upon thousands of German POWs captured in Europe were shipped back to the United States of America. Many of them were imprisoned in the South where they shared the bases with the black soldiers. And on these bases, these black men are being trained to kill, as they say in the film, these crowd bastards, to kill these Nazis. It's war, they're being trained to kill them. But these Nazis, they be, they're being trained to kill, received better food, better housing, and better medical care. And historically, the 92nd has always been seen. Time Magazine called them the hapless 92nd. I mean, they were, they were really ridiculed. And that was something that these men had went to, the, most of them went to their graves with a great deal of anger about it. I'm sorry if I sound kind of angry making this whole business about the critics and so forth. But I've met these people. And some of them, and you know, when Spike met these guys, they were so happy that somebody actually paid attention to them. And you can imagine, just multiply this 1.1 million times. 
These are the, great, these are the kind of patriots that they claim Barack Obama is not. These are the kind of patriots that have given the best of their lives to this country. And then they go up, they grow up to, to live here in New York and watch Rudy Giuliani, an Italian-American, treat their community with the kind of awful just disregard where they were in Italy fighting for the very country that he calls home. And these same men, they come here to watch their children and grandchildren suffer and smoke crack and end up as knuckleheads in prison is because society thinks and believes they're knuckleheads in prison and they, because they don't have any history. I, I met 92nd Division soldiers who, who the grandchildren come home to them and say, uh, granddaddy, they said blacks didn't fight in World War II. And then the guy shows up in the class and teach still doesn't believe them. Because you know what? Unless a white person says it happens, it don't happen. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. Barack, Barack Obama is okay. If Barack Obama... If. If. I can't. I can't. Okay. I, can, I can't either, but... When? 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 When. Okay, when Barack Obama becomes president, assuming he does. Oh, wait a minute. See, the tricksters. <laughs> I mean, when is the problem that the President of the United States be Ivy League educated? JFK went to Harvard, both Bushes and, and Clinton went to Yale. Now all of a sudden it's a problem because Barack went to Harvard Law School and was, you know, ran president of Harvard Law, that's, he's elitist. Right. And here's the thing, it's the tricksters changing the motherfucking rules <laughs> all the time.